Good morning. Another another hopefully fabulous Tuesday coming your way. Um, welcome to Coffee with Caregivers. Um, it's going to be a, a good show today, uh, a, a unique topic, one that I'm really excited about because I just really learned about this um, maybe two weeks ago and uh, it just uh, drew me in. So I will be anxious to introduce our, our guest to you today. Um, but first, you know, I usually talk some kind of a, a quote that has grabbed me during the week or one that um, I have in my folder of quotes that I feel like are important because I look at those every once in a while just for inspiration and to kind of get my head right <laughs> sometimes when I need that. Um, and it's amazing what the words from other wise people um, can do to help you become a better person uh, when you're feeling kind of down or, uh, or out on, on some things. And, and this one is um, probably by somebody that I don't know if we'd really think would have a quote about kids, but certainly because of who he was and what he did. This is by Louis Pasteur. And he said, when I approach a child, he inspires me in two sentiments, tenderness for what he is and respect for what he may become. Wow. I so often feel like a witness uh, frequently, a lot of disrespect sometimes in the foster care system. I know foster parents say, you know, we're, we don't get the respect that we should get from certain folks sometimes. And I understand that because we felt the same thing off and on for years. Uh, not the majority people, thank God, uh, but some. But for me, it's the disrespect shown to the kids in the system and their families oftentimes. Like they're write-offs, you know, um, no hope, no possibility. Uh, and, and by the way, people speak about them in front of them, the terms you use when they talk about the kids, even caseworkers with kids on their own caseload. Unfortunately, I've felt that some kids were disrespected in conversations I've had with other foster parents when they were talking about the kids who were in their family. So that, that quote hit me. Um, we all deserve respect. And, you know, if we do something to disrupt that respect, then we've earned that, I guess, and need to work harder to, to, to earn that respect back. But for, for kids in particular who do no fault of their own, have their lives completely disrupted, um, that's not fair. So oftentimes when that happens and children are asked to go into foster care or told they have to go into foster care or kinship care, and we get that call saying, you know, we, we, we've got a, a child would you let this child join your family? We know that when that child arrives, that it's not going to be all smooth sailing. There might be a little honeymoon period in there where they try really hard to write, not to do anything wrong. But eventually all those emotions are going to kick in from everything in their past and what just happened to them and why they're not home anymore. And they're going to start doing some stuff that's not going to be particularly fun or inviting or welcome, right? Um, and we have a topic today that I think is going to maybe help some of you um, figure out an, a new way or an additional way um, to engage in conversations with these kids in a way that they're not going to really understand or know that you're even trying to work on their behavior or something like that because the, of the, the the comparisons that are being made in the discussion. So we will get to that in just a second. Um, but first, my cup is full of joy, right? Joy, 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 joy. And if you are a regular watching Coffee with Caregivers, you know I talk about joy pretty frequently because joy is different than happiness. We can make ourselves happy or we can make ourselves sad. That's just the, the fact. It's up to us. Um, joy seems to come from a different place. At least it does for me. 
Um, it comes from the people around me. It comes from the comfort of my home. Um, certainly it comes from the love of my, my husband, my children, my grandchildren, my great grandchildren, my dear friends. Um, and I like to surround myself with joyful people. Um, people who have found the ability to put joy in the place of, of difficulty sometimes and put joy in the place of sadness sometimes and um, help alleviate some of those other very difficult emotions because we've been able to experience joy and capture some joy in our lives. Um, and as I've said before, you know, I think part of what what we should be doing or what we should be trying to do while we're providing that health, safety, and permanency and well-being for kids is to help them learn how to find joy in their life. What are those things that bring joy, pure joy to them, and to embrace those things? And sometimes it's hard to find that because they don't know even how to look or what it might feel like. And so demonstrating that to them is a really important So on to business. It is um, a pleasure to introduce to you two people I've just met um, virtually myself. We've had other conversation by phone. Um, but Darren and Margie Fink. There y'all are. Hey, oh, everyone. Welcome. Hey. <laughs> so um, I just love what you folks are doing. I really do. So I want to, first of all, I want you to each, each introduce yourselves and tell the audience what you think is most important about yourself that they should know. What are those things that make you, you, and then maybe what are those things that make you a, a couple, right? That's up to you. And then if you have your cup and you want to share a story about your cup, we would love to have that. Once we finish that, then uh, we'll go into your um, discussion this morning. Do you want to go first? Or do you want me to go first? Go for it. Go for it. So I'm Darren <laughs> Fink. Um, I am an adoptive father. Um, and I would say I what you need to know about me is I am a creative person. I am uh, trained as an artist. Uh, I'm also a graphic designer. Um, so I, I really, I'm also... Uh, it's funny because our group that we that we're with uh, with uh, work has uh, we've done a lot of personality testing lately. So I'm definitely an extrovert, and I like to have fun. So you can find I live in Orlando, Florida, with Margie, and we love to go to the amusement parks. Um, I actually have a mug. I have this mug here. Uh, it's one that I made. Um, it was I was making a bunch of mugs for a coffee shop. And this one, this little guy did not make the cut. He's, um, his glaze is kind of messed up and he's just kind of all over the place here. Um, so I, I held on to him, couldn't sell him. But I, I love this mug because I feel like it's a lot, <laughs> I feel like it's a lot of us like parents. I feel like we've been through the mill. We've uh, had a lot of life happen to us. And this <laughs> mug looks like it had a lot of life happen to us. But at the same token, it's, it's one of the most comfortable mugs that I have for my hand. It's um, it's a lot of fun to hold. It's easy to drink with, and it's just got a lot of good use um, from it. And it's a great mug. But if you just look at it, you can just see that it's worn and it's had. It might not be the first one that you choose if you're at the store, but um, it, it's the most comfortable. And it keeps. I love a lot of coffee, so it keeps a lot of coffee in here, and it keeps me caffeinated. So I love this mug. Awesome, awesome. <laughs> All right, Margie, tell yeah. us about you. So I'm Margie Fink. Um, as Darren shared, he's the artist and the creative one. My degree is in psychology and I'm more the, I'm creative, but I'm more in the box, analytical. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so as he said, I, we are foster adoptive parents. Um, we have four kiddos that we've adopted out of foster care and we've had some others go through our home. Um, I just, I'm kind of a perfectionist. I, and I'm interested in many, many things. Um, my cup that I have here today is uh, one that I got, and well, you'll hear a little bit more about our story and why this is significant, but it's the silhouette of Dobby the House Elf from the Harry Potter series. Um, and the Harry Potter series just has a big significance in our family and what we're doing, kind of 
how we've gotten to where we are today. And we will talk about that, but that's why I have this mug today. And I think as a couple, I think a lot of people point out all the time that we're kind of yin and yang. So if, if I can say that I'm extroverted, you automatically know Margie's introverted. Exact <laughs> Pretty much on any personality test, we are exact opposites everywhere. Along the opposites the way, do so. attract. So. Well, people say sort of the same thing about my husband and I, but we've been married 54 years, so it works, right? Right. But um, I'm the optimistic one always optimistic and my he's the pessimist <laughs> it's never gonna work yeah it's not gonna happen <laughs> and, uh, uh, thank god i usually the optimism wins out but um yeah it, we're very different as well in, in our approach to how we see things and how we deal with life um but like i said after 54 years we haven't killed each other yet <laughs> and, uh, we still get along just dandy so it uh, it's okay to be opposites so i i sometimes i think maybe it helps <laughs> i don't know yes no and humor, a good good sense of humor helps too we found we found that as a family through many times good sense of humor it definitely helps so. absolutely absolutely all right so tell us your your story all right, so uh, so our foster story, and, and Margie, like you'll see this in the play out in the story because I'm gonna hit the storytelling marks and Margie will hit with the finite the details. Like, <laughs> like details. So we started, uh, Margie and I uh, are unable to have children uh, of our own. So that was never an issue for us. I know that we, we talk with other couples that, that was a, that's a grieving process for them, that it was really sad. Uh, it just wasn't the case for us. It just kind of led us to know that the that the next step for us then was was foster care and adoption. It just kind of settled the choices there. Um, you know, so kind of nice. Been kind of a part of our life, anyways. It was something we were thinking about. Um, I grew up at one point. I ha my mom had custody of a cousin, and I was just exposed a lot to foster care and adoption. And and my father died at a young age, so I, just the concept of being orphaned was always very real to me. Um, early in our marriage, we went to South Korea and we did some work in some orphanages there as volunteers. And um, so when we came back, we found out we couldn't have kids. It was kind of like the kick in the pants to do kind of something mm -hmm. we wanted to do anyways. So it wasn't this big grieving right. process, like he said. Cool. Right. And we, so we pursued, uh, we started taking classes. We got our certification. Um, we were licensed. Uh, but before we were even licensed, I guess, we, we got a phone call that said, we had a caseworker saying, hey, we have two kiddos. They're in a need of an emergency placement, 22-month-old um, and uh, a four-year-old who's about to turn five. Uh, emergency placement, they need to move from their fo current foster home and go somewhere else. Uh, we, we literally, we were, rent we were gutting a 1913 home at the time. And with the idea that our licensing is still a ways off, we'll have it finished by the time we get our licensing, and then we probably won't even get a call for like a month or so later. So we get this phone call and we're like, hey, hey, there are no bedrooms, like literally like they're studs. So we, I told the caseworker, it really just isn't going to work out right now. Uh, and I said, you know, if, if we're a last resort, I guess call me back and, and see if we change our mind. She called me back later that day. Said, yeah, there, <laughs> I, think, no I think by call three is when we finally said yes. By yeah. call three, they said, hey, current foster family said they can hang in for three weeks. Can you get the people together, do what you need to do to get drywall and all that stuff taken care of and have bedrooms for them to live in? And the kicker in the pants, I think, too, was that around the second phone call, they said, if you guys don't take it, that's fine. No hard feelings. That's totally, yes, your call. But we are going to have to separate them because there's no one. That uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Them. So that was kind of our wake up call that, yeah, we got to do so. Um, so lo and behold, we we the kids moved in and the paint there's still new paint fume smell um, in the house like when they moved in. So um, there they were. So uh, and it was just kind of a trial by fire moment. Uh, from there on, we'd never had children before. So so all of a sudden we had two kids. Uh, the, it was almost comical. The caseworker was overworked. Uh, she had too many cases at the time. She was a newer caseworker. She literally had time to drop 
the kids' stuff off at the front door. What half like, of their stuff? It wasn't even all their stuff. She's like, I'll be back later with the rest of their And stuff. I'll call you later. I'll get all the details to you, social numbers, all that stuff later. You'll hear from me later today. <laughs> I don't think we heard from her for like four days or something. Like that. But like, <laughs> we're, so, we're asking the five-year-old, so what's your brother's middle name so we can right. try to put him in daycare so we can I go mean, back to work? Birthday <laughs> is, the is the daycare needs to know. I'm going to... Hey, maybe I'll just take the week off work. <laughs> um, so you that know, was- I, Roger, it, your story is precious, and uh, it's it's almost kind of like ours was. I owned and operated a daycare center. Now, this is a long time ago. This was 1974. So, uh-huh. now we had adopted our one daughter at that point through a um, unplanned pregnancy program. So we had a daughter. She was three maybe four, four, I guess, at the time. And so uh, anyway, I, I, I operated this, uh, owned and operated this daycare center. And I had um, two children of a social worker from CPS and, you know, in, in my in my care. And <laughs> one afternoon, is like one o'clock in the afternoon, she called and she said, um, um, have you and your husband ever thought about being foster parents? <laughs> And we said, well, yeah, in fact, we went to an information meeting about eight months ago and they asked if any of us had adopted. And we said yes. And two other couples did, too. And they said, well, you all have to leave because we don't let foster parents adopt. And if that's your motivation, then you can't be here. And that was the the, kind of the rules back then. And so we left. So we thought, okay, that's out. And uh, she said, oh, that's such a stupid law. (laughs) (laughs) I got these two little boys. (laughs) <laughs> they're 10 months and two and a half and uh, we have no place to go with them. Would y'all take them? I said, but nobody even knows where we live. You, you don't know where we live. You don't know anything about us. Well, I do know about you because you take care of my boys and I know you, you know, I I know that, that y'all are good people. I just know it. And I'm like, how can this be happening? And finally I said, well, let me call, let me call my husband. I did. And he said, well, good Lord, I don't know. What do you think? And I said, well, I don't know. Let me call her back. Well, I did. And then she said, okay, well, we'll have them over there in about a, they brought them to my daycare center <laughs> in the afternoon and said, here they are. And they had nothing. Right. And I took them home with me at, at the end of the day. Um, and, you know, I mean, I will never say who all these people work. So I, they're not even working there anymore. Thank God. But Two weeks. It was two weeks before anybody came out to our house to start, oh, yeah. to start yeah. a home study. So I understand where you're coming from. Boy, did that bring back memories no, when you were telling your well, story. And I can't imagine, like, back then, like, car seats weren't <laughs> such as big of a thing. But, like, when I had talked to the former foster mom, and she said that she was going to send the car seats. Well, they showed up to the house, and there are no car seats. And I told the caseworker, I said, foster mom said she was sending the car seats. And she said, I don't know. I do the car seats are the, that I have are the agency because they were from a different county. So there were like multiple people probably that they went through before they yeah. even got to us. Yeah. Yeah. So who knows what happened to those car seats. But then I'm like, I'm home by myself with these two kids. I've never had kids before. I have no car seats. I can't even go get them what they need <laughs> because I can't put them in the car. Right. Because, <laughs> you know, this was 2008. And at that time, you know, it was very important that they be in car Absolutely. seats. Absolutely. <laughs> so, well, like, and, and the even more comical thing too with all that too was that right before, we're nervous anyways, because we're getting our first kiddos in the house. And, and right before that, our, our beloved cat decides that he is going to get violently ill. And we, we're not like, we're like to the point where we're like, we're not sure if he's on the downward spiral. So I'm like, okay, we got to go to the bed. Um, so I'm coming back home with the cat and I, I walk through our back door and I hear these little footsteps running toward the back door. And I just see this little girl's head pop out and she's like, hey, and I'm like, hi. And she's like, you're my new dad. Bye. And I'm like, I'm like, and that was my introduction to being a foster dad. I'm like, what? I don't even know what just happened here. But now I'm a dad. You know? like, I don't even know. Like, it was it, part of me was like, no, you're a stranger. I'm like, I'm like, but so it it was almost comical just how it happened because. Um, and I remember our, our youngest son, who's 22 months at the time, he was just like deer in the headlights the whole time. He had just been dropped off and he's just kind of looking around like, what just happened? Um, right. <laughs> but it, it was it was trial by fire, like from the get go. Um, we had no idea 
what we were doing. I mean, we had we had new bedrooms, but we put the five year old up on the second floor by herself in her be a bedroom. Well, by that was the only option, really. It was, but we're just like, like looking back at it, I'm like, we we should have done like a, a travel bed or something like closer to us or like, I mean, what what were we thinking that she'd be upstairs in a dark bedroom by herself? But just things like that were. Um, but then as we as we started. Foss, we, we, they were first two and we we were said hey we're they asked if we were open for adoption we said yeah yeah we're open to adopt them um but the goal was return home yeah the goal was at the same home. time we were we were wanting to adopt so we were looking at adopt us kids at the photo listings before the kids had been placed with us we had put in inquiry about two other kids um that were actually local and we lived in rural southern illinois at the time um, and we never heard anything. So we thought, ah, this isn't happening. So this is November, we get the kids. December, we go to the agency Christmas party and the youngest, or the daughter, our daughter was five at the time and she picks this table. And all we knew were these boys were eight and 10, their names were Cody and Matthew. Um, from reading their bios, they said, but rights weren't terminated. So there were no pictures. Um, so we didn't know what they looked like. In, and, and at this time, like I said, it had been like quite a while since we put an inquiry and in, weren't thinking anything of it. Mm. So she picks this table and there's a fam foster family like right. I'm looking at their backs and the fronts because they're like they're long, long tables, 350 people like, you know, in this oh, huge room. Just it's everybody from the whole region um, for this Christmas party. And we ended up in line next to this family. And this boy is just talking to our little, you know, the toddler we had and, and everyone's just kind of chatting. And then I went to go get a drink or something and Cody was coming back from the dessert table. And, you know, you, you, when two people are walking in opposite directions and you almost run into each other and then you try to you get the little dance, like trying to get around and you both go the same way. We both ended up giggling and I saw his name tag said Cody. I was like, huh, he looks like he's about 10 years old. Hmm. And then, you know, I spent the rest of the night trying to figure out what's the other little boy's name because he looks like he's about eight. And so I finally saw his name tag. He was up singing uh, Christmas karaoke and I saw his name tag and I happened to be talking to his foster mom and nobody was around. And I said, hey, are they by chance listed on Adopt US Kids? And she said, yeah, why are you interested? I said, actually, oh we God. put in an inquiry and not, we never got anything. So we assumed we're not a good match. You know, just that wasn't going to happen. So you know, we figure they know what they're talking, they know what they're doing, you know, the people that, the caseworkers and everything. And lo and behold, she's like, you know, something's not right because all the inquiries they've gotten are from out of state or far away and they're trying to keep them local so they can keep relationships with other family members and such. And so that week I get a phone call from our worker saying, I'm hearing about these kids. You know, it's it's the same small rural agency. The caseworkers, you know, like sitting in the same, you know, cu across from each other in cubicles. What happened was the, you know, the, the, our information is supposed to go to their worker and their information is supposed to go to our worker. You know, when you hit an inquiry, it something glitched. It never happened. Oh, my gosh. And so by February, we had their, their first overnight. And by June of 2009, they moved in. So we went from zero to four in less than six months. And we were doing visits throughout that. You know, they were coming over for spring break and holidays and weekends. And yeah. It, it was. <laughs> and oh, that was instant family. Huh? Yes. <laughs> it was. We're like, uh, yeah. And from there, it just got, I think, I think almost every foster and adoptive parent can relate with us then after that. Cause I think it was, then you start the honeymoon phase is over. Uh, not only did we go from zero to four, uh, but we also had two sets of siblings in our house. So the oldest were peck, were decking it out for pecking order. Mm -hmm. um, we, we had kiddos, we have kiddos that have, we discovered they have sensory processing disorder. Uh, we have kiddos that, uh, we have our one son has a, a severe cognitive disorder uh, issue, and and we didn't even they didn't know about it. Um, they just thought he was developmental. They thought he was delayed, academically delayed. Um, and we're like, no, this is a little bit more than academically more than delayed. Um, and, and they were just, uh, I mean, we have um, I can't think of the words right now. The uh, oh. 
like attachment disorders and different things like that. And and we had just all we just had the gamut that came at us all of a sudden. It was like it's almost like um, during the honeymoon phase, everyone put their best foot forward, and then like it was like after a couple weeks, everyone's just like we're done, and they're just <laughs> like here's our stuff, like, and so we're discovering just everything like that's going wrong, like that we're just like. <laughs> Like at one point, uh, I think it sums it up best that we, because I, I mentioned before, I like to go to, amu we, we both like to go to amusement parks. We, I mean, who doesn't love to vacation? We, at that time, Branson, Missouri was the, was one of the closer places for us to go to. We love going there. So we're like, hey, we have kids now. It's going to be a total different experience with kids because we get to do all the kids stuff. Um, and so we're like, let's, let's go to Branson. Let's take them to Branson. So we, we go to take them to Branson. And we went, you know, people say leave in the middle of the night because the kids will sleep. No, but what they don't tell you is, is if you have kids from trauma backgrounds that have been sexually abused or abused in the middle of the night, yeah. they don't sleep. So all night long, we had kids hitting themselves, yelling, screaming, screaming whatever, self-stimulation to stay oh awake. Oh my goodness. We had kids saying, can you please make them be quiet? Because I want to go to sleep. And like, so we get there after six hours of driving, just, you know, white knuckled and like <laughs> barely holding it together. We're like, go to sleep, go to sleep. <laughs> um, we make it to the room. Um, I think we, we didn't even get out of the car and we looked at each other and we're like, we're never going to go on vacation again. <laughs> so, like. I mean, we had kids awake at 4 a.m. like hanging out, like not hanging, but like out at the balcony yelling and howling at the moon. And we're just like, like, I remember waking up in the middle of the night going, what is that? What is that noise? What? Why? Why doesn't? Is that someone's kids? And then I'm like, oh, no, our kids. Like, uh, so we're running. We're like, what are you guys doing? We're like, telling the moon. What? Go to bed. It's four a.m. You're waking everyone. Like, yeah. But I remember. I remember we were driving to the amusement park out there, Silver Dollar City, and I remember that um, we were just both frazzled. And I remember Margie actually. Uh, I. I I had hit the brakes on the on the van too hard because of all the noise going on, and I wasn't paying attention well enough. You know, the second when you're taking a drink of hot coffee, and the oh coffee God, just splashed yeah. everywhere, and she's like, "Take me back to the room. I'm not going." <laughs> and I, we went all day, like we went without her. Like I couldn't convince her to go. We get back, and thankfully, she, his parents had joined us on this vacation. Oh, not, on, not on that one. Not on that one. That was a yeah. They one. were. They were there. But yeah. she's like. I'm never <laughs> going on vacation again. <laughs> We're never doing vacation again. <laughs> I think that I think that's kind of what like spelled out our our uh, the beginning of our foster care journey is we just kind of like all of these and I think a lot of parents can identify with us is like you have all of these trauma things like behaviors that attack your family. And you're just sitting there going like, this is it. Life as we know is over now. <laughs> We're done. This is our new normal and we'll just have to get used to it. Like, um, actually, I think in the movie Instant Family, they have a moment like that where they're like, this is our new normal. It just stinks from now on. Like, <laughs> um, and we're so stubborn that I, I, I remember both of us just being like, no, like that's not that's not what we know. We're, we're not giving up. We even had not people- doing that. Well, we had people tell us too, like, this is what you signed up for, though. Like, this is what you got. You guys wanted to be parents. This is what you give up everything. Like, we had people telling us you give up everything. For, and we're like, so we give up all of our dreams and goals? <laughs> like, like, we're completely no longer who we were, like, because we have, like, and we just both refuse to believe that or give into it. So we kept researching and trying to learn more or find support groups or find something because we just refuse to believe that this was it. Like we're like, there has to be something where this gets better or we figure out how life works better from this. So we um we did a lot a lot of therapy, a lot of family therapy, a lot of but um one thing, just fast forwarding to what one thing that really helped us was so I, I'm I'm an art major um, and train, I'm, I'm just a creative person. And one thing I noticed with our kids was they're not, they're not kids. Like they're, they're dealing with adult issues and they've had to deal with adult issues in the past because there was no safe adult on duty usually to help them work through issues. So that was just kind of sad to me. And, and I remember like our youngest guy at the time, like he would play with like superheroes only he wouldn't play with them. He would, he would, 
like stack them up from you know shortest to tallest and it was like we're going to organize them like that's not playing that's organ that's cleaning <laughs> like that's like but that was how and it, like he that's how he would play or he'd want to you know open doors cuz he was used unbuckle to unbuckle car seats cuz that yeah, was it, what he it, had access to like he knew how to unbuckle a car seat driving down the interstate <laughs> but but, no, but he didn't yeah, know how to play with the car you know, right. like you know, you're just gonna think that's a neat thing. You know, cars go beep, beep, zoom, zoom. But if you've never seen one, you've never been taught how to play with one, it's a projectile. And oh, here, let me have that pen. I know what to do with that at, you know, 22 months right. old. And so it was, it, we just started making up these little creatures that lived around our house. Cause that's just where my mind goes. Like pretend and imagination was such a big thing for me when I was growing up. Um, my, my aunt one time was joking at a family gathering when I was a teenager, maybe even in college. Um, so I, like I had said flippantly, like you guys would all think I was crazy if I was talking to inanimate objects. And she's like, you talked to flowers and sticks when you were a kid, like, cause I was just had such an imagination. And, um, so we just started making up these little creatures that lived around the house. And I can remember we made up like these, these little, we made up a, like these little families of little people that lived in the walls and they would go, uh, they would, our kids were scared at night. So one of the tricks we would do is we'd tell them like to wait up and like they had like uh, air conditioning vents by their beds. And we'd say, yeah, they, they crawl on the walls and that's how they get out at night as they get. And they're like, really? I mean, even our, our, our nine and 10 year old are like, really? We're like, yeah, totally. <laughs> like that's how, and if you wait up long enough and just watch there, you have to lay still though. Cause if they hear you, it's over. They're back, they're back in the wall. But if you, if you're still, and we would get kids to go to sleep at night because, and uh, we'd make up things. We'd put paper clip chains together and we'd hang them out of the vent while they were sleeping so that they would wake up and see that, oh, someone made a ladder and they climbed out while we were asleep. Oh man, I'll have to try to wake up, like wait for them the next night. Um, we had some of them we had, like the little families would write little notes, like our daughter would have a rough day at school and they would write her a little encouraging note telling her that everything was okay. And just, she would write a note back to them. Um, and I mean, at some time, at some point, they obviously were like, this is mom and dad and we're playing a game and we're pretending. But they, but they, you know, what's funny is I don't think, I don't think they ever told us that, did they, Margie? They never, there was never like a clear moment where they said. I think there was one moment where one of them said, you know, I think. <laughs> You know, and yeah, you're really <laughs> <old> sneaky on us. <laughs> <laughs> but for the longest time, no, it was kind of like uh, kids that just keep believing in Santa Claus and they just keep going and never say anything. Mm -hmm. um, they were just having fun with it. And it was just our way to, to deal with it. And eventually we came up with more creatures and more activities that address different things. And it was just a way for us to have fun. We weren't sitting down and, and, and doing... Um, Margie had one time we came up with a thing because our, our kids came from backgrounds where they didn't have a lot of food in their, in their birth homes. So if they could survive on hot dogs all the time, they would, or, or Coca-Cola, that that's all they like. So we're like, Margie and I've traveled a lot around the world. And so eating different foods is a big thing to us. So we're like, oh, that's, that's how do we get them to try new foods? And, and Margie had this idea. She, she got each of them like a little, we made a creature up, of course, with it that, that I made up. But Margie had this activity that she's these little notebooks, and she'd put them beside their plates um, because our kid and and she'd have pencils, and she'd say, "Okay, I'm going to have you guys rate the food that we try tonight." Um, and she would have them either draw what they thought about it, so they draw their expressions because not we have you know a kid with cognitive disability that can't write or yeah write words, so they they would do whatever they wanted to to explain how they felt about it. But then the kicker was, is what she did was she would have them, uh, she'd blindfold them before they came out. And she'd be like, hey, we're going to put blindfolds on. I'm going to walk you to the chair, the table. You're going to sit down. I'm going to help you find your utensils so you can, I'll help you. We're going to help you feed and you're going to taste it and you don't get to see it. You just have to eat it and see what you think of it. And, and it was so clever because... I mean, the first thing a lot of kids think when they see something green and mushy or whatever, is they're like, ew, I'm not gonna try. They didn't have a chance to see it. And it was a fun game. Like it was this, this fun game of like, oh, what is it? What is it? Oh, it feels like it's squishy. Like, um, and then they would take a bite and then they, they were like little food critics. And so they really were, got serious about the food critic part because they really wanted to, and then they, that was, 
Marjorie would then we would decide like what is as a family is this something that goes on the menu or is this like yeah. never again or maybe every once in a while or you know we would talk about taste buds change so maybe you know seven months or so down the road we'll just try it again and see what we think but it turned it into a game and so it wasn't this power struggle anymore of yes you're going to because we could have easily just set it down and said well Maybe not with all the the rules with foster care now, but we could have easily said. I, I know actually we had one where we're like, for dinner time we prep the plates, like we put a little bit of everything on the plate, and you need to try a little bit of everything. Like you don't have to eat it all, but this is what you got. Um, and so we we would just do that. Like you don't get your own food, and we don't pass it around. We I mean we could easily do that, and it's a power struggle. And yes, you have to try it. No, I don't want to. Yes, you do. No, no. But it just turned it into a game and it was fun then. And they, it was funny because they would actually ask to play it then. They were like, can we? Can, like, yeah, because it was fun. And we'd be yeah, having yeah. pizza and ice cream or something. <laughs> and, we're Friday night and we're like, we're having pizza, you guys. We know you like it. You want to play the game though. Okay, get the blindfolds. We'll <laughs> blindfold you and you can eat pizza. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was just a fun game. And, and I think that's when we were just really on to something and didn't realize it. Um, We'd get called into therapist's offices. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, well, tell about that. Because <laughs> y'all told me that. I, was, I just laughed because I thought, I'm, here's the therapist is probably like, what the heck? Both the, yeah. <laughs> both the two oldest, the two oldest ended up having to do some, you know, from each sibling set, doing some therapy together just because, you know, they were trying to figure out how do we right. mesh together. And so we went to go pick them up one day. And, um, you know, you never, you can always tell kind of by the therapist's face, like how did therapy go, <laughs> you know? And she, yeah. she, you know, she's like, hey, we had a good day. Um, hey kids, can you sit out here in the lobby? I need to talk to mom and dad. And we're like- Yeah, when they tell you to <laughs> sit, kids to sit in the lobby instead of, it was good to see you guys, see you next week. It's never- <laughs> <laughs> And yeah, it's like times. being called I'm into the principal's mama. office. I'm talking mama for about 10 minutes. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you do? Are you sure? <laughs> so we go in and she's like, so the kids are telling me about these little people that live in your walls. And she's, I mean, I, like, I think she's a little concerned. What's, you know, are they <laughs> seeing things, hearing things? What's going on? Are you know, so mice? We, are there cockroach? <laughs> like, what's going on, you guys? Do I need to report something? <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? But she, so oh, Lord. we just started talking to her about it. And she's like, this is brilliant. This is great. You need to write a book. And you need to illustrate it. And because the kids are getting so much from this. And they were, they were able to just kind of deal with some of their fears and, in things like food issues or um, sensory issues. There were all these little things that we just started kind of coming up with that had to do with the creatures that um, helped them kind of overcome different things they were dealing with. Yeah, and it just made everything a lot easier too. Um, 100% easier because again, it took, uh, I keep saying it, but it I can't express how relieving it was just to take the struggle out of things. And it was now, it was fun and it wasn't like a, I am the adult and we have to do this and I will make sure we do this. And if you struggle with me and put up a fight, I'm gonna have to drag it. Like it just, it took, it, it let everyone's guard down and we worked on something together and it was more relationship oriented right. um, doing it. So it, it's funny because it's, uh, it's become, it, it's some of my favorite times uh, with the kids growing up, it's funny how they remember don't remember or don't remember things though, because some of my favorite times they totally don't remember them, or they like I think it's like selective remembering <laughs> that they don't. Because I'll be like, remember that time? And they're like, what was that about? Like, yeah, I think I like, but whether they remember it or not, it was it was still like I know that um, we've just had times where I, I saw breakthroughs. Um, uh, man, we I mean I'm even thinking right now, and we even had. Uh, just times where our, our daughter that was worried about um, there not being enough food, like there was a creature that addressed that. And it was, it, it, it wasn't like a foolproof, like one, one morning she just woke up and was like, I'm, 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 I'm not worried about food anymore, but it definitely helped. And it was able to make it so that we had something to talk about and, and push things through. So right. it was great. Well, yeah. tell me a little bit, um, cause we've been talking quite a while. We're going to cut it in pretty in a few minutes, but how you got involved with using like Harry Potter uh, 
uh, characters mm -hmm. and things like that to find a character that kind of matched what was going on with a particular child at a particular time or something that you could um, kind of yeah. talk about that and you helped your kids that way. I mean, I just think it's, you've gone beyond the imaginary um, mm -hmm. creatures to a way of looking at books and movies and comic books and all kinds of things were for characters that you can use depending mm -hmm. on what each of your children needs, what particular thing you need to work on uh, with a particular character as the kind of the lead intro oh, to wow. the topic. So um, could you talk about that a little bit? And then we'll, we'll tell folks kind of where they can go for a lot more information. Yeah, let me, I'll, I'll give the short on that. It's so we, when we moved to, from Illinois to Tennessee, we, we were trying to get our kids interested in reading and we were going to be going to Universal Studios in Orlando. Uh, and our kids were excited about that. And of course they wanted to watch all the Harry Potter movies before they went to that. The Universal has like an area that's Harry Potter themed. Uh, and so they wanted to watch the movies. Well, we wanted to get them interested in reading because that hadn't Stay been there. something, a focus of like their, that hadn't been a focus for their childhood was reading. So we wanted to get them excited. So we said we're every, every uh, night we're going to read a chapter. So we read one chapter every night. The first night, our, our at the time, our 12 year old son, um, who, who, you know, 12 year old boys, macho. Uh, he also has trouble just kind of uh, express, re acknowledge, or, uh, accessing words in his mind and, and expressing himself, expressing his, uh, knowing what his emotions are. So he uh, broke down crying at the table. And so that was a kind of a huge flag to us that we're like, what is going on? Talk to him. And he said, I get how these characters are feeling. I, I completely get these characters. Uh, the more we talked and explored, um, he, he just opened up a lot of past trauma that no one had heard from before. It gave him a voice to hear the characters in a book and he could say that, that's what I'm feeling. Um, so the short of it is our kids then got excited about that. They wanted to tell other foster families and adoptive families how they could go through that particular book and uh, talk about issues and different things like that. And then Margie, along with it, Margie and I are like, well, if the kids are writing a blog, why don't we, we're reading the book anyways, why don't we give the parent perspective? So we wrote- There's all kinds blog. of caregivers in Harry Potter from yeah. family caregivers <laughs> to teachers and boarding schools and things. And, mm -hmm. and they are all very different and have different approaches. And so we would talk about what, as caregivers, we could learn from those caregivers. So that's when we just kind of discovered, um, we, we went on vacation, we went to, uh, went to Universal. Uh, we actually had, We'd only started the blog maybe for a couple weeks. We went to Universal. We talk, I, I, of course, again, I'm outgoing. I talk with people. And some people are like, hey, we follow you guys on social media. Um, I'm like, what? And they would show me their phones. And sure enough, they were following our, our blog. And I was like, huh, that's interesting. And it just happened a couple times. So I just kind of chalked it up to a couple freak situations. We get home and our voicemail, there's um, a voicemail from the Knoxville News Sentinel uh, newspaper wanting to do a story on our blog. That's weird. So we, we did the story with them. Um, her kids had named the uh, blog Hogwarts Adoption. And I said, we're getting some attention. We better change this thing. We're going to get sued um, from a family blog. Right. Um, so we changed it to Transfiguring Adoption. And that's when we really started to um, look at other media. So uh, that's, we started to look at making it into a nonprofit and how do we use other media? Cause we're like, if we're having this success with Harry Potter, what else can we use? Mm -hmm. and, and over over the few years that we had had the kids prior, we had seen the power of songs. You know, there was one song that I would put on repeat in the car and one specific child would sing it and I would sing it and that child knew that I was singing that to her. Mm -hmm. And none of the other kids knew what I was, they're like, why are we listening to this song over and over and over again? But it's the song, song said, I'm sticking with you no matter what. You can scream, Absolutely. you can shout, you can put up your walls. It'd be a lot easier if you take the walls down, but no matter what, I'm sticking with you. And it would just go on repeat, especially on a hard day. You know, so we were seeing music, other books, you know, there were books that we just, even board books, at 
you know, the kids being even close to middle school and stuff, we could sit down with board books and be able to express things to them that they wouldn't get otherwise, or they'd be able to talk about and process things. Or, you know, we could talk about the characters and mm -hmm. so we never have to say, hey, you know, why are you doing such and such? You know, mm -hmm. we can talk about, hey, do you see how that character's doing this? You know, is that working for them? Or what, what do you think they could do? Or you just, you know, talking about the characters, it's judgment free, it's safe, right. you know, and you're never having to say, hey, mm -hmm. well, like, like, let's dig up my garbage, you know, you know, to talk about what's going on with me. You can talk about a character and process mm -hmm. things in this like safe way. And yeah, it was and that's what I thought was, just, was just so exciting about mm -hmm. the, the approach. Yeah. And it was not point the bonding. Mm -hmm. yeah. bonding and shared experiences at the same time. And it was like just melding us as a family in ways that, you know, we weren't able to, you know, all these other things that we were trying weren't working, but this was working. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we even Very still cool. do it with that. I, I mean, our oldest is 21, our youngest is now 13. And we still, I, with movies um, and video games, we, we do the same thing. We'll, we'll find things that we can talk about. Um, I mean, even the when, when, we, when we were talking about this, when this was filmed, we, uh, we were, the movie Doolittle has come out this year at some point in 2020. Uh, and we were, we were watching that and I, I ended up having this great, um, probably an hour long conversation with my kids after watching the movie with how do we, what's a family? How do we find strengths and weaknesses of a family, family <clears throat> teamwork? How do we rely on each other? Um, and it was just this amazing conversation. Um, I mean, it, it, it's just, the concept is just amazing and, and you can really get into some deep things and you're, the thing I like too, is it's, we're taking our entertainment and stuff we're going to do anyways for fun, and we're turning it into a powerful tool that's actually building our relationships. So I think that's that's one thing that I really enjoy with, with just the concepts that that we're using. So, um, what is your the address to your website? The address is uh, transfiguringadoption.com. .com. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I'm hoping there we go. We've got it on the screen now. Um, and, uh, you know, I'd encourage um, our viewers to take a look and uh, look at all the, the ideas that you have on there, um, how you have uh, folks that are helping you, um, you know, develop materials and things that could make it easier for parents to, to learn to do this. Uh, so they don't have to do so much research on their own, <laughs> watch mm -hmm. maybe so many movies and how many books right. they have to read before they find the right one because you've got people who are doing that. Um, I think it's just a huge um, a benefit for, for folks that are looking for new ways or additional ways to, to interact more positively with their with their kids, especially those that, like you say, you know, it's hard to do the eye contact conversation. It's easier in the car when you're driving and the ones in the back seat and you're in the front seat and you have actually have pretty good talk sometimes, mm -hmm. but you can approach things in a different way. And this is kind of one of those different ways of, mm -hmm. of being able to approach a conversation um, with a kid that needs the conversation, but isn't maybe going to be happy about it. Right. It's, a, it's kind of the traditional way that we've been parenting. Mm -hmm. um, well, our time is up and I, you know, it went way too fast with you two. <laughs> um, and, uh, but, but cause I think the, what you're doing is, is wonderful. And, um, not only that you've done it with your kids, but that you're sharing with other parents. Um, uh, that's, that's just huge, uh, because you're an advocate for all kids and families and that that's where my heart is for sure. Um, so any like final closing things you want to talk about till we, before we go to our cartoon for the day? Um, no, I mean, I just, I, like you said, if, if people want to get, uh, continue the conversation more, they can go to our website. Uh, we're on Facebook. Uh, at you can just search for Transfiguring Adoption. Um, we'd love to see you guys there. Um, the stories that we talked about are in, uh, we actually have a book that just came out that all of our stories and activities we did with our kids that we just said, um, you can find that on our website or on Amazon. Um, so yeah, we just, uh, yeah, we just enjoy hearing from people and just hearing how we can help other parents and just, cause we, we know what it's like 
to be that go through that trial by fire and and feel <laughs> discouraged and feel like your life is never going to be the same and and we don't, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't have to be that way and so we want to be that support for other parents so that they can they can parent their kids better and, and just feel empowered and like they're succeeding awesome well and right our wonderful designer here. We have all different kinds of shirts and stuff. And um, the shirt I'm wearing today actually says, it takes a village, see the true child. And it made me think when you were reading the quote at the beginning, see the true child, there's so much, you know, we see behaviors, but yes, there is a child with amazing potential underneath, um, you know, exactly and it's right. just helping them overcome what they've been through. And, you know, there's a lot of our own work that we have to do in that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but just seeing that. <laughs> right. I mean, we, we learn about, we well, at least we did. We learned yeah. so much about ourselves with every mm -hmm. child that joined our family. I mean, mm -hmm. we, we became uh, better people. We became um, certainly more understanding and accepting and empathetic and sympathetic and <laughs> all yeah, those things, sure. you know, and um, um, learned that, we could handle a lot more than we ever dreamed we could. Um, uh, and uh, we didn't give up on kids either. And sometimes it was, uh, we didn't know who, who was going to survive the ordeal, but <laughs> you know, we all did. Right. right. And, um, and things are good. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And yeah, let's, really. let's see if we can take a look at our cartoon. Sean can put, there we go. And as y'all know, these are all COVID related kind of things. So scenes from self-isolation. Mom says, okay, what do you need? My friends, other people, my old life back. No, I mean from the store, bagels. So, <laughs> you know, we're kind of all there. We're, we're missing all of the, what we had and, um, and we're eating ourselves <laughs> full of food, it seems like. And uh, I get I get so many. My God, they ate up all fifty dollars worth of the treats that I bought for the week in two days. <laughs> what do I do now? <laughs> a lady just told me that the other day. And she said, I can't keep doing that every two days. It's never ending. You know, it's just if the answer is in food, it's always food. So anyway, uh, I thought that was a, a, a good one. Um, so thank you, thank you again, and um, I hope our paths will cross again soon. Absolutely. Uh, thank you for um, being willing to share uh, what you've learned and with other people, because that's huge. Absolutely. And thanks to everybody who has uh, participated in this episode today. Um, have a good week, and please stay safe and healthy. This episode is brought to you in partnership with our friends at United Healthcare. For more information about United Healthcare, please visit www.uhc.com.